Consequence of cellular responses and errors in DNA methylation maintenance, cells can undergo two, two types of uh, changes. And it's very important here to make a distinction between the systematic and the stochastic ones. So we can talk about systematic changes when all the cells undergo to the same change and they will uh, generate a very homogeneous gene expression profile. So those changes may be just a response to mechanism of adaptation and may be actually good changes. The problem is more with the stochastic ones. So they occur when cells undergo to different change. Cells start to accumulate what we call in this case AP mutation and will um, behave in different way. And you can imagine that if we have a situation where each cell starts to do something different, the, the organ functionality will be impaired. So while those changes can be studied with very common available technique, to study the stochastic one, we really need to look at DNA methylation pattern at the level single cell. And uh, this has been so far a, a major challenge. In fact, cell-to-cell -cell heterogeneity has been defined as one of the major stumbling blocks of the biological investigation of aging. So the, the aims of the project has been really to develop a novel method to detect DNA methylation at the level of single cell and to assess the random accumulation of alteration in the epigenome with age and to determine the extent with a focus on the aging brain and finally, to study a possible link between increased heterogeneity and functional decline. So again, to assess epigenetic instability, we really have to look at single cell. Um, one of the most common ways to study DNA methylation consists in treating a DNA with bisulfite, which converts unmethylated cytosines, while the methyl into, into uracil, while the unmethylated methylated one uh, remain unchanged. And uh, you can imagine that working with single cells, only five picogram of DNA, has been really, really challenging. Uh, the bisulfite treatment itself is very harsh, and the, the DNA tends to be degraded after treatment. So we really have to find the right balance between having uh, DNA not converted um, after two months treatment, which will be really bad because we'll generate false positive, of having DNA too degraded and too fragmented if the bisulfite treatment is too harsh. So we find the optimal conditions, and this is where we are right now. Basically, we isolate single cells using a common uh, mouth capillary approach. We denaturate the DNA from single cells from five picograms of <laughs> DNA. We perform a bisulfite treatment and next step is a whole genome amplification of the bisulfite treated DNA. And here we can follow two ways. One is the local specific approach. And in this case, we target promoter regions of interest. And uh, we target using conversion specific nested PCR primers. And next step will be sequencing analysis or, or epityper. Or we can follow the genome wide uh, method 
which I will explain better later, but to basically what we do is we target a portion of the genome and we perform um, next generation sequencing on the library that we generate. Um, so how, do we, how can we distinguish epimutations from incomplete conversion? This slide is a bit complex, but uh, please stay with me for a few seconds. I will try to simplify. So I'm showing here two examples. Let's say that we have um, two cytosines that are fully methylated and a um, demethylation event occurred. What happened after bisulfite treatment is that these cytosines that undergo to an IP mutation event get converted because it's unmethylated, while the other stays unconverted because methylated. And the, the close by that are not in CGD nucleotide will get converted. So we, we can easily call this an IP mutation. It's more complex when we have um, hypomethylated cytosines. Let's say we have here two, two CPG sites that are not methylated. And a methylation event occurred so that the first one become methylated. What happened is after bisulfite, this will not be converted and the other will be converted. And how do we know if those are epi mutations or incomplete conversion cases? The only way to know it is by looking at cytosines that are not in CGD nucleotides. And we really have to have a full conversion of those cytosines in order to be able to call an epi mutation. So just to summarize these slides, the message I want to give is that it's really, really important to have high conversion of unmethylated cytosines in order to call an epimutation. And uh, this is really, really important point. Um, so let's go back to the local specific approach. Um, basically, as I mentioned, we target promoter regions of interest using nested PCR primers. And I'm showing here a few data we obtained on single fibroblasts. Uh, this is an F2 promoter is a stress response gene. He's highly expressed in fibroblasts. And I'm highlighting here the cytosines uh, in CGD nucleotide in the promoter region. Um, we expect this promoter to be unmethylated. So what we see uh, in gen the genomic DNA extracted from fibroblasts, we see conversion of those cytosines, which is what we would expect. So all the C are converted into T. When we look at the single fibroblast, um, we see again full conversion. So in all the, the CG sites. And so this is what we would expect. There are no epimutations. And we obtain full conversion on non-CPG cytosine. So it's 100% conversion. We try then to switch more to what we were interested in the most, which is the brain. And in this case, there is some complication because it's very difficult to isolate single neurons. So the strategy we adopted was to isolate the nuclei to a saccharose density gradient. Then we target the nuclei with a new one, which is specific for neuronal nuclei, and with DAPI. And uh, we perform fact sorting, so we can sort single nuclei in each tubes and then perform our methylation assays. And here I'm showing some data we obtained in the neurons. We target the cip 7 one a promoter, which is a liver-specific gene. It's not very much expressed in the brain and is supposed, we expect to be fully methylated. So here I'm showing again the cytosines that are in the promote in CGD nucleotide. And as you see, after uh, bisulfide treatment, the genomic brain DNA, uh, the cytosine won't get converted. So this is how we would expect this fully methylated promoter. Then we look at single neuronal nuclei. I'm showing a few examples. And here, the majority of the cytosines in those sites won't get converted. So again, these are fully methylated. But some of them will get, are converted into T. And this is an example of um, epimutations, demethylating events. 
And again, we get very high conversion on non-CPG cytosines. So we have done this in several cell types. We target several promoters, but we are extending more to other, other promoter regions. And so far, using this local-specific approach, we were able to identify few epi mutations, demethylating events. And again, the conversion rates of non-CPG cytosines is almost 100%. Uh, we started to apply the say into uh, new neuron extract, uh, neuronal nuclei extracted from uh, young and old uh, mice. Uh, these are preliminary data. We are extending to more promoter regions. We target as first GABRA one, which is uh, a brain specific gene, is highly expressed. Promoter is acromethylated. And so far, we, when we didn't detect any uh, P-mutation events. But, of course, uh, we need to look at much more uh, promoter regions and more animals, and we are performing this right now. So now let's switch to the genome-wide approach. This is much more powerful because it allows us to interrogate um, many, many cy cytosines in CPG denucleotides. <laughs> so the, strate the strategy consists in basically we take the single cells, bisulfite and all genome amplified DNA. We perform an en enzymatic digestion with MSC1, which is a four basis scatter enzyme, and uh, it cuts in TTAA sites. We use this enzyme because we want to generate lots of fragments to be able then to target a portion of the genome. And also because TTAA, uh, I somehow this enzyme allows us to select for fully converted DNA since I um, want to remind that all the C will be, will be converted into T when are not in CGD nucleotides. So basically the next steps are really library preparation steps for next generation sequencing. And we perform a site selection of those fragments between 250 and 300 base pairs in order to select 1% of the genome, and the next steps are um, enrichment, PCR, and finally, um, next generation sequencing. Um, so we started with a pilot experiment where we took a single hepatocyte from a young uh, mouse, and uh, we isolate single hepatocytes, and we apply this reduced representation approach. And in parallel, we took the genomic DNA extracted from a pool of hepatocytes. And the idea is to compare the DNA methylation patterns from the single hepatocytes with the pool, which is the reference methylome. So only in this way, we can really see whether there are epi mutations or not by comparing single cell with what's going on in the average of the population. And here I'm showing an example of the sequencing results. As you can see, we, we get good coverage. All the C are converted into T. So it's very high conversion rate on non-CPG cytosines. And also, this is an example of methylated CPG sites. <laughs> and we can also eventually detect SNPs. Um, so here are the data we obtained from the single hepatocyte experiment, the pilot experiment. And um, we were able to get very high conversion rates of no CPG sites, almost 100%. And uh, very interesting, 7% uh, of demethylating AP mutations and about 4% for the methylating AP mutations. Um, this was very interesting to see and this really, really novel data. Uh, because so far it has been not possible to study uh, epigenetic instability. And it's kind of, it's very interesting to see that demethylating events are higher than methylating ones, because you can imagine that methyl groups must be restored at each cell divisions, and the enzyme responsible of restoring those groups, which is the MT1, may, may make some mistakes and forget at each subdivision to restore those methyl groups. Um, and here it's an example of demethylating epi mutations which result in the converted cytosine. This is from the single hepatocytes. 
So we are applying right now these methods on uh, the neuronal nuclei from young and old. And just a week ago, we got new data that we are currently analyzing. And so the conclusions so far are that to study DNA methylation in aging a single cell, um, we developed a basophyte-based protocol of high C2T conversion rates, and that the reduced representation basophyte sequencing approach suggests that genome-wide patterns of DNA methylation can be analyzed on single cell. And we are currently um, there is lots going on and lots of work still to do. Uh, we are assessing the sensitivity of the single cell methylome typing. And this is done by increasing the cell to cell variation in DNA methylation using 5 aesa which is a demethylating agent. Uh, we are continuing optimizing the whole genome amplification and currently screening cells, individual cell population from young, young and old mice neuronal nuclei. And next we'll be assessing um, functional an analysis. And I just want to point out is that the single cell epigenomics allow us not only to investigate epigenetic instability in aging, but there are so many other approaches and questions that we will be able to answer using this approach. And I uh, would like to thank all the members of Fig Lab, uh, in particular Jan, my PI, and Michael and Brandon that has been done lots of work on the computational parts. And all the other members of the lab and the, the facilities, our collaboration. And uh, big thanks to Sense Foundation that has been sponsoring this project. And I finish here, and I want to thank you for the attention. Um, a comment and a question. The, the comment is that your, your results on the level of uh, new methylations and demethylations actually very closely parallel what we did close to 20 years ago, where instead of isolating single cells, you did the hard work, we subclumed and mm -hmm. resubclumed, and we found about 10% demethylations and about 4% uh, new methylations in fibroblasts. So it's, it's yeah, almost exactly the same. That's yeah, really the same. The, the, the question I have for you is, is there, is, is there a reason other than the, the cost and the need for new equipment to, do sing, to isolate single cells as opposed to looking at full haplotypes, which you can do, or at least partial haplotypes, with generation, what are they up to now, four sequencing, where you're actually sequencing single molecules? Um, I th the problem is that we don't really know how rare those events are. And um, we may lose information by, um, by sequencing like a pool or haplotypes. And so for that reason, we decided to go for uh, assessing the patterns in single cells. Now generation four is single molecule uh, without amplification. So there's no pool and there, you know what I'm saying? There's, yeah, there's yes. Like but the risk is that uh, the sequencing run will already generate some errors, and with that, you may lose the information. It will be dif difficult to be able to assess for sure the epimutations because we, you will not have like enough coverage. Thank you. Um, first of all, mm, very, very beautiful work. I have just a curiosity, maybe mm, there's something I've missed in your presentation. How can you avoid uh, to take at a single cell level cells which have the, a genome uh, epimethylated? There is a big window where the cells have the genome epimethylated after replication, which is the method you use. If not, uh, every time so you see this little mm, quantity of uh, non-methylated CPG island, it's very mm, probably that it is a due to that part of cells in active proliferation. Of course, in fibroblasts and hepatocytes, in neurons, it's quite different, problem. Um, so your question is whether uh, this cell cycle state 
would affect. Yes. Uh, yes, that's um, that's a actually good question. Um, I think the idea is to really try to get cells that are as much as possible in the same state. And in the case of the neurons, uh, we know that neurons don't divide, and also we try to uh, to target the ideally the cortex, so we can compare really the same type of cells and um, be able to say something about the epigenetic instability. But yeah, it's a really good point. Hi, uh, nice talk. Um, 5-hydroxymethylcytosine is a new mark, and it's thought to be involved in like the transition from methylated to unmethylated or vice versa. Can this technique detect that mark? I thought of it, and of course I would love to be able to, to work on that as well. I, I think um, one of the problem is that the bisulfite treatment is not capable to, it won't allow us to detect uh, the hydroxic states. And to do so, you, you have to uh, use techniques that use, usually enrich the, the hydroxic methyl groups or use antibodies. And I'm a bit skeptical that that is possible at the level of single cell. But it will be great, of course. Okay, I guess we'll move on to the uh, second speaker, uh, Dr. Kekane.